Welcome to The Ancient Light of the Yeshua Teachings, eight-episode mini-podcast with actress, musician, and author, Verenia Nia Peoples, and ancient Aramaic wisdom keeper, Dale Allen Hoffman. Episode 3, The True Meaning of Spirit. The question I have is: There anybody who who's on the call that I you know, I can see most of you that you maybe you were reading the Bible and you just thought something's not quite right, something's off, but you didn't think, oh no, this is a total pile of crap. It was more like something's not right. And I thought that at the age of seven, uh, I sat on my grandmother's living room floor. It's it's amazing as I say it. Well, there's two reasons it's amazing. One, right outside my office is my grandmother's uh, high-tech, mid-1960s stereophonic console (laughs) that I was sitting right next to when I was on her floor, and we would listen to her gospel records on that. It's sitting right outside my office. I finally got it reconditioned last year. But I compared five Bibles to each other. She always had lots of different Bibles. She had, like, Greek lexicon Bibles and the King James, the New King James, the 1611 King James, all three of which are three totally and completely different Bibles, if you don't know that, and they're all King James. I was shocked as I got older and I learned that long, this is a quite a while ago, there was currently in print, I think around the year 2004 or so, actively in print at that time was a little over 3,750 versions of the Bible. And uh, I was shocked when I looked into that and found out that um, in order to publish it, the Bible, although it's in the public domain, there had to be 22% unique unto your edition in order for it to be considered publishable and, and to be able to put any, you can't really copyright it per se. And I was like, wait a second here. So I've been told for all this time that this is, you ever, you ever heard the inerrant word of God? And somehow, if you publish a Bible, it had to be different. And it's funny, I, I worked in, not in the publishing industry, but I worked in the audio audiobook industry for quite a few years while I was doing all this on the side. And I was working in packaging audiobooks, things like that. And I was shocked when we would get like all these different versions of the Bible and it was like the golfer's Bible and the doctor's Bible and the college student's Bible. And they were all totally different. We also did Chicken Soup for the Soul, if you've ever heard of that, the Jack Canfield series uh, and uh, Mark Victor Hansen. And there was like everything, every version. There was like the, the golf pro soul. There was like the, 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 the chauffeur's soul, the, the ice cream scooper's soul. I'm going a little out on a limb here, but my point was that it's kind of like that with the Bible. There's a lot of them out there. So maybe, just maybe, the issue wasn't just with our thought that it was the inerrant word of God, but also maybe something in that was wrong itself. Like maybe the word word isn't quite accurate. We did talk a little bit about that last week. The word that's translated as word, milta, means something much more akin to willed action or uh, anything that's done in a state of presence that has a will, like a creative willingness. It's really hard to put this into English because it's not an English word. So I started finding these things out and I was like, wait a second here. How many people did I actually know that actually thought that God, quote unquote, G-O-D, physically wrote this book through humans and that it was absolutely inerrant. I still know a lot of people that think that. And of course, once you study the Bible, if you still think that something's a little off there. But one of the words that I wanted to, well, the word I wanted to focus on today is a word that gets thrown out all the time. Everybody, we're all sort of spiritual, right? You know, we, we, we seek to have a spiritual lifestyle. We seek to expand our spirit, you know, whatever people say, raise your vibration, all these different things. But how many people really know what that means? And even more so, how many people would actually be surprised to know that Jesus never heard that word in his life, spirit? 
wow, that's kind of weird. Do you ever think about that? The word that he would have heard in his native Aramaic sounds like this, rucha, rucha. Let me see if I can actually pull up. I think I can actually pull this up for you and share share the screen here. Okay, host disabled participant screen sharing. So that means that if Nia's on, she's got to undisable that if I for me to be able to. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> that was <I'm> quick. On. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So can everybody see that? That's the word rukha. And funny, this what the text behind this word that you're seeing here is something called the Kaborix Codex. The Kaborix Codex was actually found in it's a it's a I believe it's a 5th century copy of a 2nd century text, early 2nd century text. And this was actually found in the Kurdistan mountains in Iraq in the mid 60s, I believe it was right before Muslim invaders moved into the towns of Malula, uh, Bakka and Jubaden, which they still bomb today and leveled the monastery this was in and all those other texts were burned. This one actually was pulled out and came into the possession of an American attorney by the name of Dan McDougald. Uh, but if you look at this word right here, Rukha, just by chance, this, can everybody see where I'm circling? That's actually the word Rukha in the text right there. So I actually chose this one because it was there. What I do is I actually work with these texts. I work with lots of other texts, huge, like digital photos, uh, x-ray photos. I use digital lexicons, all different kinds of things to do the work I do. And then what I do is essentially I take the, uh, I take the basically the black and white scholarly translate translations and I what my my job is essentially to wake them up. What do I do? What do I mean by that? What that means is that I take something really stodgy. If anybody's a fan of Coleman Barks, uh, he does the translations of Rumi. 99% of the translations of Rumi on the market are Coleman Barks. Coleman lives just a few hours from me. He's a weird, weird dude just like I am. And what he does is he takes those black and white translations and he wakes them up. He breathes into them. He meditates with them. He goes to sleep with them on his belly. He you know, wakes up in the middle of the night scribbling down insights. He has these multidimensional experiences so that he's not necessarily translating it word for word in a way like as an example, if I go to Russia, I think I might have said this in the last call, but let's say I go to Russia and I use an interpreter and through that interpreter, I say, I like this guy. So I say, tell him I said he's bad. And of course the interpreter would say, Dale says you are no good. He says, you're bad. And I'm like, whoa, 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 that's not quite what I meant. And the guy gets kind of offended. And then I'll go, no, 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 all right, let's try this. Tell him I said he's cool, okay? And then the translator says, Dale says that you have a very low body temperature and you border on being cold. And I'm like, no, that's not exactly. I'm actually, when I said cool, I meant, I don't want to say hot. No, don't tell him I said he's hot. Wait, wait, wait. And you get into these kinds of issues that my point isn't that because in a lot of with the Aramaic, I can't, there's no words in English for it. What I'm trying to do is to interpret it on an experiential level. So the word we're going to talk about today is that word Rukha. Rukha is a word. Um, I'll actually show you a different. What you're actually looking at here is the Beatitudes. And right here is the word Tubvehun. That's the blessed are. And over here is Lomaskena Baruch. Baruch right here. That's basically the word spirit. Ruch right there. Now that's what anybody know what the first beatitude is? Who knows their Bible? Usually people kind of look down in a way when I ask Bible questions because I realize that the first blessed are. Anybody know what that is? Hmm. I'll give it to you. I think everybody's muted anyway. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's an interesting word because in order to explain Rukha, I'm going to explain the word before it, Maskena. Maskin is an interesting word because if you just have the consonant sounds, I'll just say in English it would be M-S-K-N, M-S-K-N. If you have five consonants to get, or four consonants, M-S-K-N, people 
look at those five consonants. And if I said pronounce that without any kind of a vowel sound, people tend to say miskin, miskin. That's what you're going to say. I don't know if I've never met a person that said, well, okay, maskin. You'll, you're not thinking that or meskin. It's when you have MS together, you're just thinking mus, mus, mus. And what happened was these ancient Aramaic texts were translated into what are now called the Greek originals without the benefit of phonetic markings, without the benefit of the vowel sounds, the, what's called diacritics, diacritical marks. So they had to guess on a lot of the sounds. And they guessed on this particular word, poor in spirit. Poor in spirit, you can probably do something with that. Feeling downtrodden, you'll notice that a lot of the translations are basically Jesus in all kinds of places all over the New Testament telling people that if you're, excuse me, if you're, that's my dog barking, if you're getting the piss whooped out of yourself in life, don't worry about it because after you croak, you're going to be fine and you'll go to heaven. That's kind of a lot of the basis of the teachings. Unfortunately, that one that was that poor in spirit, that word poor is an interesting word. Let's say that, you know, if you can see my hands, let's say this index card is money and it's $3,000. And let's say it's all the money I have in the world. I have no place to live. I have no other possessions. I have no job, no family, nothing. And I'm opening my wallet at three o'clock in the morning, like a smart person in New York City in in a dark alley. And somebody runs up and rips the $3,000 out. So if that's all that I had in this world, you could say I was what? Poor, poor. But that's not quite what this word means when you put the ah sound in or the ah sound there's two little dots above the letters that would connotate a slightly different meaning, not poor in spirit, but rather let's say I've got a wallet and I took the money out and I put it in my front pocket. Now the wallet's what? Empty. There's a huge difference between poor as in lacking versus empty as in open. And that's what this word really meant. It meant empty. And also in the word empty, maskin, it also means home or sanctuary. So rather than a poverty or a, a poorness, I'm inventing a word, rather than that idea of poor as in lacking, we're talking about a, a conscious creative action of being empty, of being open. And in that emptiness, in that openness, you find your home. In what? In spirit. Well, what does spirit mean? So let me give you an idea. I used this as an example for milta, the word word last week, but see that nice little chime. Here's the word rukha. This is the literal definition of the word rukha. It means frequency literal definition frequency frequency what's an example of frequency well the first example of frequency we we call that call that you know spirit we'll get back to what spirit is okay spiritus in spirit what's inspiration breath now in the ancient aramaic understanding if jesus would have used the word rukha in most cases, they wouldn't have thought of this disembodied spirit. They would have thought of breath. Ask you a question here. How many people have ever had an idea that in standard Christianity, it's all about being aware of your breath and breathing? No. It's about spirit. What spirit? I don't know. It's this, this, this kind of thing out there. Uh, in John 3, as a matter of fact, the, the text is a ma- that that I pulled up earlier was actually John 3. Let me pull that one back up again. So right here is the word. This is actually in Johannan 3, John 3. This is Jesus talking with a guy named in, in Aramaic Nicodemo or Nicodemus, Nicodemus, who was, of course, the leader of the Jews, if you know anything about uh, the Bible. And he was talking about Rukkah. And what he had said was in the Bible, it, well, that we're used to, I should say, in the Gospel of John, we're used to how the wind comes and we don't know where it's coming from or going to, but we hear its voice. When he said the word wind, guess what the word is? Rukha, frequency, vibration. So we've got spirit, we've got breath, 
We've got wind. We have me up like this blowing, just blowing air on my skin. We've got music, tones, harmonics, frequencies. These are all examples of frequency. Uh, magnetism is an example of Ruka. Today, nuclear forces would be an example of Ruka. Not heat per se, but the force of heat. The feeling of heat on your arm, the force of heat pushing against you would be considered Ruka. Gravity is Ruka. These are all examples of things that I don't necessarily know what it is. I don't, I, we can get into all kinds of great mathematical scientific debates about it, but we don't really know Average people don't know what the heck that stuff is. Daddy has to tell me. Was that a Zoom bombing or that? I don't know what that is, but anyway. So what I'm saying is we don't necessarily know what all these are, but we can actually obviously, very obviously experience them with our senses. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you think about something like magnetism. You think about breath. Breath alone. Empty in the breath, home, blessed are those who are empty in the rise and fall of Rukha, the rise and fall of their breath. Blessed are those who are empty in the, the movement of air across their skin. Like imagine sitting out by a stream and it's just a gentle breeze blowing and you're aware in that. We're talking about these eternal forces, the, the, the force of the, anybody that's ever been around the HeartMath Institute and the, the force field of the human heart that goes out, according to Joseph Chilton Pierce, a little over 17 feet on average. When you have big, deep experiences, it goes out almost 30 feet, just the frequencies and vibrations of the heart. Whoa, that's pretty big stuff. But when you start thinking, wait a second here. So when he was saying spirit, most of the time, it was really breath. What I'm telling is you you can go, here's what you do, okay? Drive by a hotel tonight. Uh, you don't have to get the room or anything. Just ask to go in and, and go into one of the rooms and steal the little green Gideon Bible. That's <laughs> I don't do that, but just get a hold of a Bible that you don't mind marking up too much. And every time you see the word spirit in the words of Jesus, cross out the word spirit and write the word breath above it you'll get a much more accurate understanding of what was being communicated there in a way that his listeners would have understood. That disembodied spiritus thing happened centuries later. He wouldn't have had any idea what that was even. Of course, he was talking about things, you know, in the Gospel of Thomas, we're going to go a little Gnostic here. In the Gospel of Thomas, he says the kingdom of the Father or the kingdom of the One, the undivided, is spread out upon the earth, but people do not comprehend it. They would say, can you tell us when the kingdom will come? And he says, well, it's already happened, but you do not perceive it. You don't comprehend it. You don't see it. You don't have a clue. He's talking about things that aren't physical things you can hold in your hand, but you can, everybody knows when you're having a deep experience. Everybody you've ever been around, especially the birth of your own child, but the birth of a child, you know, powerful, intimate moments, a great film. I, I'll say I just watched Judas and the Black Messiah last night, which if the 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 couple of main actors in that don't win Oscars, something's wrong with our system, which means they probably won't. But it was this incredible emotional roller coaster of seeing people with tremendous power and also tremendous vulnerability. And that's a hard thing. I mean, Nia's an actress, obviously. She knows, you know, what I'm talking about here, but this amazing film and my experience, all I was doing was looking at pictures on a screen, you know, video and stuff moving and hearing sounds. And yet I was having this deep spiritual experience. All the frequencies of light and color and sound were moving in through and around me and giving me this experience that was resonating all of these frequencies and harmonics within myself that literally was this orchestral feast. It was as if I was there in the room. And there was a couple of places. I mean, there was one particular scene, I'll say, where without going too deep into what exactly was going on, and I don't want to give too much about the film away, but basically a guy, you know, puts his gun in the main character's face 
and the camera follows him and he's walking backward through a bar while this guy has the gun on him and i'm actually you know, like shuddering a little bit because i mean it was like very very and here it is i'm just watching something on a screen that's not you know quote unquote real so to speak so I can tell you one thing, I could feel my breath catching. When I watch films, I've reminded myself for so long to essentially breathe that I don't have to remind myself anymore. But I'll say this. Have you ever noticed what happens? Let's say we're going to talk a little bit about something related to, to, to frequency, to Rukha. Let's say somebody walks into the room. You're a great spiritual person. You're advanced. You're amazing. But there's that one person you know, the one you don't quite like, and they walk into the room, and if you haven't seen them for a while, you had no idea they're going to be there, and they say just the right thing to you, what does your body do? (gasps) You stop your breath, it catches, or somebody pulls out in front of you on the road, (gasps) you stop your breathing. Now, we're going to look into this a little bit deeper. Why would you stop breathing in that case? Maybe somebody can I don't know if we we can't unmute everybody. It would be like total chaos, but. It's unexpected. Unexpected. What just the, and why, ah, I see the word fear over in the chat. It's unexpected. So why would something unexpected from, you know, prompt you to stop breathing? What is that? How, how is that? Is that what? Just a fear of, well, it's fear is part of it. Isn't it a quick like inhale, like like I need a, yeah. more oxygen in that moment, and then it's ah uh, interesting, interesting, because what's happening there, according to Jesus, was is that you're well you're getting what we now call triggered, but something in your system is resonated, just like if I put a guitar next to a piano and I play something with the piano and I can sort of just form, I've got guitars all around me in my office here, form a chord on the guitar and it'll actually start resonating with the piano, especially two pianos. Of course, empathetic or sympathetic vibration. But what Jesus says is that, or said, I said Jesus instead of Yeshua. What he said was essentially that something's coming up for you and the way to lock it down is to stop breathing. So what does that mean exactly? Um, Let's look in a little bit of a word here. Anybody know what the word forgive means? What does forgive mean? What does that mean? You forgive somebody. What does that mean? Literally or like to me? You want to know what it is? No, don't give me your to me stuff. (laughs) (laughs) We have these deep conversations that last hours all the time. So it's like, basically, I think what people, you know, we we have this idea from the Latinized languages, from the Romance languages, which is be- basically pardon, pardon. Essentially, I let you off the hook. I forgive you. And that's kind of the cultural thought about it. Let's look at that in a little bit of a different way, though. In Aramaic, when we have an experience where something is let's just say something is brought to the surface from a prior experience. We don't like the way it feels, so we naturally stop breathing to block its vibration. Kind of like this, you guys love the But what if I went Depending on how loud your speakers are, or if you were in a room with me, most people go because we don't like the way that feels. So the first thing we want to do is to stop it, to stop the vibration of that, to stop the resonance. But here's the thing. When you stop the resonance, and the more you stop the resonance, the more you push it down, the more you push it down, the more you push it down. You're actually adding kinetic energy into a spring. Ultimately, you know, sort of me as a, as a child having been let's just say, you know, molested and leave it at that many, many, many times. After a while, I sort of became numb to the experience. And then when I get in relationships later in my life, it's like uh, when all that stuff starts coming up and I wasn't, I wasn't even aware of it. In a lot of ways, I had blocked it out of my consciousness till my mid twenties and it all came flooding back out. And it's amazing that, you know, let's put it this way. You've got a three-year-old girl, 
and make this a little more basic. And her father comes home late. He went drinking. She knows that he's going to want his ashtray. So she goes to grab his ashtray as he comes in the front door completely drunk. And instead of grabbing it, she accidentally hits the glass ashtray. It flies off of the table and smashes on the floor. And the father, not even touching her, not even touching her, bends in and screams her down into a fetal position on the floor. What is that three-year-old not doing? She's not breathing. That's locking in the system. 30 years later, she doesn't even remember the experience. Here she is with her life partner. Maybe there's the scent of alcohol on the partner's breath. Maybe they say just the right thing. It doesn't really matter the words. It doesn't matter any of that. But just the right frequencies begin to resonate in that experience. And all of a sudden, the 33-year-old girl now is looking at her father from the perspective of a three-year-old, and she has no idea that it's happening. And that persona lays over the present moment. And it's interesting how Jesus said, that in which you judge another, you are guilty of practicing. And then he went, ape. And we're going to talk about Ape in a few in one of the next programs, but I'll just give you a little bit of a little bit of a sneak preview because it has to do with what we're doing today. That word hypocrite means persona or mask in Aramaic. The mask is all the trauma, all the pain, the pain body that Eckhart would say. You know, we can say ego, ego's a piece of it, but not the whole thing. Now, all of these experiences that we're having are giving us these responses to previous things in the past that we have stunted viewpoints of how much does a three-year-old really know about what was going on in that room at the time and all these experiences are coming up so when we have other people that are around us that sort of bring that stuff within us and we're constantly pardoning them oh don't worry i forgive you for doing that i forgive you because i'm spiritual what we're actually doing is we're allowed to tamp all that stuff back down and not deal with it But if you realize that in the ancient Aramaic, the word for forgiveness, you'll forget the word, but the word forgiveness is shabuk. And what shabuk means is to remove the root of my suffering. Remove the root or cause of my suffering. So rather than me forgiving the other person or even forgiving myself that is important though that is big i'm not taking that off the table rather than the pardoning we actually how do you how do you get into it deeper i'm actually telling you when you feel crappy like that you may not necessarily want to do it in the moment sometimes you have to leave go to another room sometimes you have to deal with it later and that's what my work is you know forward backward upside down and inside out but you actually breathe into it And you're actually instigating those frequencies to sound a little bit more and allowing those to come up and then allowing them to actually be okay. And it's funny that when you allow another person or yourself to be who they are, right now in this moment, you allow who they are not to fall away. When you allow a person or yourself to be who they are in this moment, you allow who they are not to fall away. Whereas when you're in resistance of what you don't like, you're you're literally going back in and hitting those same frequencies over and over and over again and hammering them down into the system. Truth be told, of course, that's what you're going to do because we're not taught about these kinds of things. Not just in the West, but I mean, it's funny how like most of my fan base is, is around in Europe. And it's like 1.30 in the morning here. They're all like, tell that people's lady to try. And I'm like, I can't, we can't do it for lady. everybody on the planet all at once. We're not going to get everybody's uh, eventually, you know, we could get the right time and then I'll start getting emails from the penguins in Antarctica and telling me how I didn't time it right. But what I'm saying is if you can actually get into these experiences where you would normally lock down and see that as a place for healing, see that as an opportunity for allowing these to the surface. And it's, not Dr. Feelgood. When you start doing it, you don't all of a sudden feel, oh, this is beautiful. You actually feel like all hell is breaking loose because it is. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said that in our, he said, that which you bring forth from within will save you. That which you do not bring forth from within will destroy you. <sighs> Big. So just think about those people that come into your midst 
who you lock down the presence of. It's amazing because there's there's a, a teaching that Jesus gave us, and he said, love your enemies. And people go, what does that mean, love my enemy? First of all, in Aramaic, there's not really a clear word for enemy, especially not this word. Let me explain it. The phrase sounds like this, ochebu, and then the next part of it, I'm going to grab my mic here, Laboiled bubaikun, achebu laboiled bubaikun is what it sounds like in Aramaic. Achebu is a form of the word love. Chuba or chabu is a word for love in Aramaic that's a little different from rachma, which is the word for love where it's like this deep ecstatic, you know, for your lover, for your children, your best friend. Chuba is the kind of love in Aramaic where it's kind of like you're taking a, there's nothing there. So you have to sort of take a couple of rocks or sticks and kind of scratch them together a little bit to create the spark and then fan the flame. It's rather than a love that just empathetically opens you, it's a love that comes through the setting of intention of you saying, okay, I'm going to create love in this situation doesn't feel like it's happening. So you think of the person who you who you consider your enemy. Well, that word boiled bubaikun, the root boiled literally means to strangulate. It means literally to to choke off the breath. So who is the enemy? It's the person that you stop breathing in the presence of. It's the comment on your every once in a while, I'll just kind of like haphazardly like look at like I don't remember what it was. There was something that Nia posted like a few weeks ago. And I was like, have you, do you ever, I was like, do you ever look at your Instagram comments? <laughs> I'm like, you've got like, you know, some really awesome people here. And then you've got really, really awesome people here. Like interesting to see some of the comments. Some of them are uh, like amazing. And the other ones, it's like, wow. Um, and it's funny to me because like, regardless of what it is that we're putting out on a frequency level, each person that perceives that is going to get their own experience of it in relation to all of the frequencies, vibrations, harmonics that are going on in their own energy body, their own body temple. So we're each going to have totally and completely a unique experience. If we could. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm. No, I was going to say, do, do we have time? I don't, I don't know what else you're teaching in this. Uh, in no, this I'm, I'm kind of pulling this actually, because I wanted to get this kind of closed okay. a little earlier so we could open up for more. Okay. So it's, it's about the concept of forgiveness and, and what you're speaking of and how you really do that. You know, to me, a forgiveness is, is a way of not changing the past, but breaking the chains that bind your past to your future. And it is that frequency change. And so whenever I feel that, that arrest inside me, I mean, it doesn't, and it really doesn't even matter if the person is out of line or not. Yeah. If it's, if it's bringing that thing up for me, then there's something in me that needs healing. And so the word forgiveness is such a funny word to people because it would be really easy for someone to say, oh, I just have to not be mad. But that's not what it is. It's, it's like, help us understand how you literally overwrite it. Like you shift it. Like when I get that kind of a grip in my belly, I recognize, wow, this is an amazing opportunity for me to breathe into it, to bring awareness to it. You know, if I was that little girl that got munched by her father, I am going to breathe that and recognize her and recognize her pain and allow it to move through me and find the singular truth in it. And even in the midst of all of that garbage, whatever the garbage was that was going on, if I can find the purity of, of, of truth, which is that we are all one and you can, you can find even with someone that, um, that is so challenging somewhere in there is the truth that they they care so much about you. I mean, I'm giving you an example that they get angry when you don't do what they want you to do because they want you to succeed and they think they know how that's going to happen. Whatever that is, there, there is a seed of truth. And so h- help guide us in that process of forgiveness. Like what is the process that works for you when that stuff comes up internally? Yeah, I've got actually different ways of it, all of all of them, though, are rooted in one thing. 
they're all rooted in breath. I've, I've been, well, you know, I've been a certified breathwork practitioner for 30 years now. This is my 30th year. It's crazy because I've met so many, everybody, Tom, Dick, and Harry, they're everybody's breathwork practitioners, which to me, yeah. people are like, oh God, there's too many. I'm like, there's never too many. I was like, when everybody on earth is a breathwork, breathwork practitioner, then maybe we can go, ah, cool. Incredible how to me the process is first of all it's funny how it kind of goes in phases the first process or the first part of it for me is we've we've heard it all the time you know the, the generations before us said it a lot bite your tongue don't lash out i think that's kind of step one is that you just and I mean, don't you're, don't act on that energy yeah, that's yeah, coming up you're, that you're makes just, you want to slap but, somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, and, but don't don't stymie the impulse either. And I'm not saying you know whack them, but <laughs> what I am saying is, it, it this take this part alone takes, uh, and I people hear it and they go, oh god, and I'm like, they're like, how long does it take to get that first one down? And I was like, honestly, for me, I shouldn't say it, but uh, it took years of me remembering not just to not jump out because I'm, well, you know, I am smart ass extraordinaire. My mother said it's better to be a smart ass than a dumb ass. I'm from New Jersey. It's all you need to know. Uh, and it, I tend to be, you know, new, in New Jersey, everything's delivered with a smile of sarcasm. Sarks, sarcasm. Sarks means to cut, rip, or tear flesh. That's the <laughs> Latin root of the word sarcasm, but with a smile. <laughs> so, but it, it, the first is the, the not acting. I don't want to say not acting out, but rather allowing it to ground by breathing. And of course, your face is going to turn red. Your neck's going to turn red. You're going to feel heat. Guess what that is? That's what Jesus, well, what now is today called hell. Hell is the moment of overwhelm when something is resonating in the system and you're almost like in this like cyclonic moment of overwhelm that you can't see anything you're almost like stuck in the moment stuck in all the things that are happening right now it's not a place you go to after you die that was Gehenna which people don't even realize Gehenna is just the city trash dump in Jerusalem down on the south side they don't even realize what all these words actually meant so the first thing is the not acting out remembering to breathe into it and then if you're able to do it with if you have a person that's conscious enough i i'll say it right with them you know my friend mike he, you know he's and and loretta obviously my wife of 22 plus years there's people in my life where if something comes up we hit it straight on we don't go and bad talk each other we're just like all right you know mike's like whatever you said i want to punch your face in right now so let's talk about it and you pull it out. You don't necessarily do this with everyone, but the key here is to bring it into your awareness, maybe after you're away from the person that you feel was your trigger point here, and being able to sit with it, have a piece of paper, and literally write down, I'll say Dr. Michael Rice has a worksheet that's really great. His older worksheets are better, the new ones are more chaotic, but where you're literally sitting down and you're bringing into your awareness why am I feeling this way? What is it that's coming up? And it's funny because in the first you're going to go, oh, well, because she said blah, blah, blah. So write it down. You know, she, whoever your trigger person is, blah, blah, said blah, blah, blah. Write that down and look at it. And this is something I actually learned from Les Brown, who is one of my, basically my original hero as a, as a professional speaker. He's like, let's see how much you can really get into the emotion of the experience bring your back back bring yourself back to the moment when that happened and literally put yourself back in that place and breathe into it but allow yourself to feel whatever it is that you're feeling allow yourself to feel it fully and i tell people your 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 elbows your hips all of your power points are going to get real loosey-goosey your face is going to start turning red you're going to feel that heat what you're going to do is you're going to continue breathing, though. And I also say with that piece of paper, start writing down what you're feeling. What are your thoughts? They're probably attack thoughts. You know, I want her to just F off. I want her to go away. I want her to leave me alone. I want her to, te you know, speak to me with respect. Write it all down. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. And what happens is if you literally allow yourself to feel what you're feeling, it's probably not going to happen while they're standing there in front of you. This will probably be something you're going to go back to later in the day. You'll notice that the next time that person shows up, 
they might trigger you again. And after a couple of times, you're not lashing back. And then after a while, you're not feeling as much of the intensity. And if you just keep pulling these layers off, it's like peeling back that sweet onion that they speak of. Ultimately, you'll get to a place where it doesn't bother you anymore. And eventually, if you keep doing it by just literally allowing yourself to feel what you're feeling, consciously taking ownership and responsibility from that for that and basically removing it from the system, ultimately, that person's going to walk in the room and you're not even going to remember that you ever had an issue with them. But, but how do you do that? You just do that exact process of allowing yourself to feel it, breathing through it, and then you do it over and 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 that but after that though is the most important part because that's when you do it over and 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 people think oh god you know and what's amazing though after a while you get five years into this and you get 10 years into it just this process alone of breathe Allow yourself to feel and allow it to flow through the system. Breathe, feel, allow. Breathe, feel, flow. That's the first three Beatitudes in Aramaic. Just those three over and over and over. After five years, you notice things are a little less intense, 10 years even more so. People can, it's amazing. Like people can walk up to me and say stuff to me that, you know, 30 years ago, I would have instantly been swinging. And I, it doesn't even pop me anymore. It doesn't resonate me anymore. And it's amazing. People try to get my goat doing the work that I do. People that are like, I say it with all the love of my heart, religious nuts, and we're going to move past it. And they'll sort of make all kinds of accusations and all kinds of things just to see if they can trigger me. Yeah. But I've done this work for so long on such a deep level, so much breath work, breath work, breath work, breath work that I realize it's less important what I know, it's more important how I carry myself in the situation. It's more my essence, my energy, my presence. Well, there's, something really, there's something really interesting that happens too in your personal relationships and it's quick because I think a lot of times people don't realize, especially with longer relationships, you have this push-pull system it's just, yeah. here's my frequency and there's your frequency. Here's how you get along with me. And it's just this energy dance that we have. It's different with every person. It's not the same with either of my siblings. You know, with my mom, it was different than with my dad. It's different than each of my children. And so you have this energetic dance that you're constantly doing. And when something, you know, ah, something in that relationship gets your goat. When I choose to see the truth and I work through the breath that way. And just like, don't, when I breathe it like that, it's almost like that hook that gets thrown out there has nothing to hook into. That's it, the key. And so they're not getting back the, the, the push that they're used to. They, they can't even, most people can't even identify because you think, oh, well, why would they be doing that? So I bark back at them. Who wants to be barked back at? But barking is energy. And so it's an energy grab that they don't even realize that they're doing. And so I have seen things change so quickly with individual people by me doing exactly what you're saying. You breathe, allow it to move through. They can't catch anything. And so either the relationship shifts or, or they, they roll away. Off. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's big. Pretty that's magical. huge. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's a funny thing too, how I've actually worked with people not only in the mentoring that I do one-on-one -on -one with people, just people that have been around me for years. It's amazing to see some people terrified to forgive anything because they're afraid they're going to lose their family. They're afraid yeah. that everything's going to change. Um, and, you know, the truth of the matter is it's almost like ultimately for me, I I'm like each moment is another opportunity for me to dive sort of fall backward off the cliff with my eyes closed in a way. And I know for a lot of people that might be a bit intense, but it's amazing to see people. I tell them, well, then forget all that. All the people might be going away. Just take care of what's up in the moment. Sufficient unto the day are the evils thereof. That word isn't day in Aramaic. It's actually the moment. Sufficient unto this moment are the evils, where the word evil is bisha which I spoke about it in the last call. It's like a piece of fruit that's either underripe or overripe. 
meaning that it's either like stone green or it's like black oily oozing festering, meaning it's not fertile and ripe in the moment. It's just not going so good right now in this moment. And if you realize that, just take care of what's up now. And then in the next moment, you'll take care of what's happening then. And then the next moment, and then the next moment, you know, it's, it's, it's not much different than uh, being in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never, you know, never been a member, but I have a lot of friends who I've gone to lots of AA meetings with people. And it's amazing how how much forgiveness is involved in that forgiveness of self forgiveness of others it's at every step of the process the first really the first step is essentially realizing that you've got an issue that you're co- totally and completely powerless to and of course you're giving that over to god and it's it's all these levels of forgiveness and it's the fu- you know speaking of the give and take of a relationship that's been there for a long time it's true it's like when the the fight goes out of it. I've seen some relationships just get amazingly stronger. And sometimes you'll see one doing the work and the other doesn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. And yet, and I'll just tell them, you know, don't look at them as an enemy, just stick with what you're doing. And then a lot of times you see the other one come around just because of the example this person sets. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times you see that person just kind of wander off and the relationship sort of goes somewhere and they're no longer together, but yet you see this empowerment that all of a sudden when that person who has been doing it over and over and over again, and they're really deep in their spiritual process, they realize a little further down the road that that relationship had to fall away in order for them to go up into that next paradigm. It's like Jesus was giving us all this stuff and somehow um, 99% of what he said was taken away from do this and get this. And it was all turned into these like platitudes and like, you know, good boy, good girl statements and, you know, get whipped up in, in this lifetime so that after you croak, you can go to heaven, all that kind of stuff. So um, do you want to open this up to any questions? Yeah, Absolutely. Does anybody have any questions um, on this subject? I know forgiveness is a major one. And um who was it that said ultimately all forgiveness is self-forgiveness, like on the deepest level, on the deepest level? All I don't know, but it's true. So it's self-forgiveness. Yeah. Questions, anyone? If you have a question, just unmute yourself and shout it out. This is a really powerful um, conversation, I find, you know, and and no matter how long you do the work, something always comes up. (laughs) You're like, ah, I thought I was finished with that. And it's just like, (laughs) yeah, you you're done with it on that level. Now we're going to go deeper and now we're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's pretty amazing. I find that, hi guys. (laughs) Um, so yes, I completely find that like there's layers, obviously there's layers of, of that healing. And, you know, Nia, you and I have talked about like, you know, we're doing the work and it's continual. It's never ending because there's layers to it, but there's also, um, well, one of the things that I had mentioned in there is that, you know, like when we get triggered, um, I always think of it from a perspective of, you know, when we come across somebody that is triggering us or a situation or actually just a person that's triggering us, I find that, you know, the people are able to only meet you to the depth at which they've met themselves, their own selves. The amount of inner work that we've done or that somebody else has done or has not done is going to, I think, kind of play out how this, how that interaction goes. And so when I feel like I've been wronged or when I feel like, you know, why is that person being such a jerk? You know, all I've ever done is, you know, and you start to get into that like pity party It always takes me out. I take myself out of the situation and I'm like, okay, I know that there's X, Y, and Z happening in this person's life. And I know that they're not coming to me from a a place of wholeness or even a place of self-love, you know? And so if, if somebody's going to come at me and, and be a jerk and be a, you know, be really yucky and nasty, it's a reflection 
right? Of, of how they feel about them, their own selves, you know, maybe. So anyways, that's just kind of what I find. I, I try to see the bigger picture. I see the long haul of, of a person as opposed to just that situation. And then Dale, can you talk about, you know, what you know, or your experience with even that ancestral trauma? you know, the, the, the trauma that has been passed down generationally and things that, um, you know, that we've got to do the work in terms of that. Cause that's some deep, deep stuff. You know, it, it's, it's amazing the, you know, the way I look at it is like, we're healing the generations, the past generations for the present and future generations. And it even says in the Hebrew Bible, that the sins, you know, the mistakes of the father are passed unto three and four generations. And then you go back with what about their three and four and their three and four. And it's almost like a network marketing thing where it just fans <laughs> out and it's just huge. It's just massive. And here's little old me. And yet this network web goes back and you think about that. We don't even we don't even know a lot of like in the deep breath work that I've done for years. A lot of times I don't even know what's happening. I don't know what's healing, but then you come out the other side and we've done, you know, Loretta and I have done breath work with Nia multiple yeah. times. Um, and it's amazing how a lot of times you don't have a clue, but you no. just feel that something moved in the system. That's the power of Rukha. That's the power of spirit. The power of breath yeah. is you don't actually have to even know what's going on. A lot of times, as long as you're willing to keep your breath moving, just, Write the word breathe on pieces of paper and note cards, put it all over your bathroom, your bedroom, your car, your office, your cubicle, whatever. Yeah. And just remembering to be aware of the movement of your breath, that alone will change the world overnight. Overnight. And trust it. Because yes, I mean, that's absolutely. The, you know, if you enter into a breath session or any kind of a session, at least I find this with an intention of I'm gonna figure this out, whatever this is. Oh yeah. It, it's a block. You just put the wall up. Get it. I hear it all the time. People say to me, so do I like go into this with an intention of what I want to heal? And I'm like, no, no, zero intentions. You're, you're asking me if you should come in holding on to the thing you're trying to let go of. That's what you're asking right yeah. now. Like, no, not exactly. Yeah. Your body you is just so just ride the breath wise. and trust the, the, the rise yeah. and fall of the breath. It's almost like surfing. And you just, you, you have, in order to be with, I'm saying this only because I see a lot of surfing movies. Yeah, I, surf. I, was like, I get, hey, I get drilled in the no. pipeline, but, <laughs> but it's like just with the, the wave, you know, you're riding that wave and you're you're when you get to the place where you're one with it, all these things just happen natural. If you keep rem reminding yourself, breathe, 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 breathe. It's a total co-creation and Absolutely. you have to trust it, you know, that it's going to take you. If you, if you try to push against the wave, you're going to get buried. You know, you are riding, all it is, is water caught up in this wave of energy, like energy. It's just energy flowing and, and the water is caught up in it. And we get to, to ride the face of it along with it and co-create what's happening. And you have to be one with it. And, and the, it's the same thing with the breath. And your body is so wise. It knows what needs to come up first. Like Absolutely. if you had something about your mother that you really wanted to clear and had forgotten that something about your dad needed clearing and your body knows that that needs to go first before you can get down to the root of your mom. Yeah, it just happens naturally. It happens yeah. naturally, whatever. And you'll just from you remembering to breathe, you're going to be healing yourself whether you're doing the process of forgiveness or not. Just the act yes. of being and being aware of your breath Eckhart get into some Eckhart Tolle stuff he talks about it all the time and then he'll make fun of all the egoic stuff that we do and really if you just be aware of the rise and fall of your fall of your breath you're not going to get any more spiritual than that that is the root of everything and then just stand outside yourself and be aware of what's coming up you know oh 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 <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Yeah. And like, you know, Vicki wrote the unconscious mind controls the body, but 95% of the things that we do in an average day are coming from the unconscious and we're totally and completely unaware of it. We're just these almost like aut automatons. Is that the word wrote like these robotic things? But the more we get back to the breath, the more we have that conscious creative, it's not control. It's different than control. It's this, it's literally this beautiful dance of energy, this beautiful dance of all the harmonics and Rukha, that word, you know, our word for the day is right there at the root of all of it. Yeah. So beautiful. 
Um, Dale, we're coming right up on the end of it. Is there anything you want to? Yeah, I I don't want to go into a sales mode, but I'm going to because I realized after all these years, um, like I'm getting ready to start releasing all kinds of new audio visual programs like 4K about toning and all this other stuff on udemy.com. So I decided to take after years of putting, I've got like a 30 disc program with my book and I've got these little USB drive cards. I'm just going to open up a window that's on my website to show I decided today um, that I was going to basically cut the price of all of my stuff in half on my website. Um, Originally I was going to do it like just like for a little while, but I don't know. So if you go, you just go to DaleAllenHoffman.com and click on special offer. Uh, You can get like the little USB drive card or the full set version. Like the USB drive was 125 and the, the version with all this, it's 30 discs, DVDs, CDs, my book, all kinds of other stuff. That one was 150. I cut it to 99, but That's um, crazy. I'm just saying, I, and the other thing to look at would be if you want to go deeper into this, that's the crash course. It's the only one that exists on the planet. Nia's got it. Yep. And uh, the other would be the mentorship page, which is where I work a lot deeper with people on a one-on-one base- basis. That's how I met Nia basically. Um, it's well worth she, it if this is yeah, something so, that you guys are interested uh, I'm in. just saying, if it, if it feels like you're you know in over your head, one of those, uh, especially the, 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 the audio video programs, um, it's like a hundred and some hours of teachings. It's like going to a college that does not exist. So, and, and you know what's really beautiful about that right now? I find it um, even more applicable and important now because what we're – what we're being called to do is create a new in a way that's never been created before. And so learning things like what you're teaching today about forgiveness and what, what did all that really mean? It's a system. It's the system that we are. And so how do we work together with that system in this new creation of the, of the new world that's coming? I mean, we can see the old one falling apart around us. Thank God for that. But, but it's a tough transition for everyone. So these are the tools that we need now more than ever, now more than ever, because we are the light workers who are creating the new world we're moving into. We are literally the ones we've been waiting for. We are, we're the seventh generation that, that Tashunka Witko of the Lakota crazy horse spoke of in 1877. We're that seventh generation. We are all of like, all of this that we're like, people are like, God, don't you wish you were alive 2000 years ago? And I'm like, well, who's to say I wasn't number one, number two, I'm like, this is the big game. This is it, right? This is, this is game. it. This is the yeah. quickening. You know, this is the age that we've been waiting for. Yeah. Someone's asking, what's the Aramaic word for fire? There's several, one would be nohrata, uh, nohrata, which is an interesting word. Jesus said, those that are near to me are near to the fire. And nohrata, by saying that, nohra is already a a feminine word. By calling it nohrata, he was gendering it double feminine, meaning that he wasn't saying be near to him and burn. He said, those that are near to me are near to the fire. Those that are far from me are far from the kingdom. That fire that we're talking about is literally the fire of self-reflection. And that's the burning you feel. There's no outside force that's trying to pull you into the pits of hell. It's your own resistance that causes the burn. That's a huge thing. And by being aware of the breath and allowing yourself to breathe, flow, feel, that's the forgiveness process that moves us through it. It's purification. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to honor everyone's time. Dale, this was exci- so amazing for me. It went I mean, fast. <laughs> it went really fast. Um, and so what's up What's up for next week? Share with us what you'll be sharing. Uh, next next week, week is, uh, let me pull out my little list there. Yeah, next week we're, we're going to actually go a little deeper into forgiveness. And I, I want to kind of keep hammering that one in, but we're going to talk about what I touched on about the mask, but basically the ideas of hypocrisy and repentance and what that really meant which is nothing like what we think it means at all, actually. Nothing. Of course. Nothing like the, <laughs> the, the representation that the, the church has of it at all. They don't even know what it means. But we're going to look at it in Aramaic and in Greek because they both are very, uh, they're both, both very interpenetrated and actually complement each other very nicely in what Jesus was trying to say. 
That's beautiful. All right. Well, then we will be back here next week at a very inconvenient time for everyone in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> They'll watch it later on YouTube or something. So They'll watch posting, it later. So. so thank everybody so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you next week. Dale. Bye. Love I'll you. talk to you later this week. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs> thank you for listening to The Ancient Light of the Yeshua Teachings, eight-episode mini-podcast with actress, musician, and author, Verenia Nia Peoples and ancient Aramaic wisdom keeper, Dale Allen Hoffman. Please visit niapeoples.com for Nia's upcoming event schedule, books, and support product offerings. And please visit daleallenhoffman.com for Dale's upcoming event schedule, books, audio and video programs, support product offerings, and to join the free Aramaic Healing Circle email newsletter. We are committed to your awakening. 